Welcome to Naples, to our department and to the 88th Congress of the Italian Geological Society. Uh, such a conference was held for the last time here in Naples uh, in 1929, so about 90 years ago, as a full conference of the Italian Geological Society. So for us, for our generation of uh, Neapolitan geologists, it's an uh, honor to be here uh, and hosting you in, uh, in, on this occasion. Um, this is not the official opening of our Congress, which will uh, uh, have place tomorrow at 9 at the main uh, place of our conference, which is the Department of Jurisprudence. Uh, this is a sort of pre-opening. And uh, uh, with the main uh, event of this afternoon is the uh, plenary lecture, the first plenary lecture, which will be uh, delivered by Mike, Mike, Mike Bento. Um, mm, I don't have any uh, additional words to spend just to thank you all to be here with us uh, and I hope you'll join, uh, you will enjoy this conference uh, in the next uh, days. Thank you. Buonasera a tutti. Eh, quando io ero uno studente, molti anni fa, in realtà, eh. okay. quando io ero uno studente moltissimi anni fa a un certo punto sono diventato appassionato della pantologia dei vertebrati e il libro di testo, allora come oggi, allora come oggi era questo, Vertebrate Paleontology di Benton, si dice che non potete giudicare un uh, libro dalla copertina, e questo è il motivo per cui qua andiamo l'originale. Mike Benton è eh, il massimo esperto mondiale di eh, transizioni dopo le estinzioni di massa, sono quei mega eventi che hanno cancellato buona parte della, della vita sulla Terra. La peggiore di queste è successa 250 milioni di anni fa e quello di cui ci parlerà proprio eh, questa sera Mike è appunto come la vita ha recuperato dopo l'estinzione per Motriassi, con un'estinzione che ha cancellato oltre il 90% delle forme di vita. Adesso in inglese per il nostro ospite. They say you cannot judge a book from the cover, says the guy in shot. <laughs> so, <laughs> I was saying then that uh, when I was a student, I got fun with the uh, Vertebrate Paleontology by reading their book. And just because you can't judge a book from the cover, is this is original Mike Benton to you. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Uh, mi scusi, uh, no parlo italiano, so I must speak English, I'm very sorry. Um, I want to talk about um, the greatest mass extinction of all time, um, but I will not talk about the extinction itself uh, and the uh, uh, current work on models for extinction, uh, about which a great deal of work is being done. I want to talk about the recovery uh, of life after the extinction event. Um, and this is quite a new field of research, maybe in the last 10 years, there have been some uh, large advances. And I will try to cover two aspects. I want to show you some uh, uh, basic uh, field work in China, uh, which has contributed a great deal of information about patterns of extinction. And then I want to talk about some of the numerical methods that paleontologists now can use uh, in trying to uh, look at the pattern of evolution and even processes of what might be happening at that time. So these are the main topics that I would like to cover. And uh, first we will go to China and see what we can see. So some of you may know that the classic uh, uh, Permo-Triassic marine boundary sections are in China. The boundary of the Permian and Triassic uh, is formally marked in China and the uh, part of the reason for that is that there is a very rich fossil record. Uh, this diagram shows the pattern of extinction in the sea. The, the diagram shows uh, uh, the time scale and the Permo-Triassic Permo boundary is here um, and there are some 550 
uh, fossil species, marine invertebrates, each shown by a vertical range line. Uh, and what was noticed, and this, this has been studied and then studied again, um, so this is perhaps the latest version, there, there, was, there were previous uh, 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 diagrams, but this involves more intensive collecting, more data. Um, <clears throat> and what was noticed was, first of all, the extinction does not happen at the PT boundary. The PT boundary is here, and in fact there are two levels of extinction, one in the latest Permian and one in the earliest Triassic, A and B. And the uh, 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 rate of extinction, the amount of extinction, is as high as people had uh, expected from global science. So I'm not going to talk about that tonight, but people had already done a great deal of um, uh, uh, in, uh, a global scale study, and they had already arrived at figures of 90% for the rate of extinction, 90 or 95. And so here, the uh, number of extinctions is equivalent to something like 90%. And then the second level of extinction is about the same percentage. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, <coughs> okay, so um, I hope you've been here. I'm sorry about that. Uh, so, the two steps of extinction were perhaps unexpected, and in between these extinction events, some, something interesting was happening that the, um, there were num a number of steps of extinction, and you'll notice that most of these species in here had originated and gone extinct quite quickly. So these are probably what people call disaster taxa. There, there is some uh, uh, poor quality environmental conditions between A and B, and the species um, can recover quickly, but they go extinct quickly. So there is a lot of turnover, uh, and these are disaster taxa. And then eventually after B, it seems to settle to some more normal conditions. Um, and there have been considerable efforts to date these uh, uh, sediments and one of the reasons that this is the international standard is that there are a number of volcanic ash layers through the succession and it's possible to get quite good quality radioisotopic dates. And they suggest a time span of somewhere between 60 and 180,000 years for the duration of those two. I want to move forward though into the Triassic and concentrate mainly on the recovery time and uh, the uh, one discovery which was made maybe 10 or 15 years ago, uh, which many of you will be familiar with, was that um, somewhat unexpectedly the um, isotopic uh, 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 spike that happened at the PT boundary was repeated several times. So at the PT boundary here, there is a sharp uh, carbon isotope spike towards lighter carbon. Um, and this was repeated here and here and here. And um, so this is work of Jonathan Payne and many others have confirmed that since. So in many cases when people study mass extinctions, they focus very closely on the event. Here they have extended for five million years after and there are repeated um, carbon isotope excursions, which seem to be all as serious as the first one. And there's a whole discussion about how that could happen. If, if the um, influx of uh, uh, light carbon reflects um, release of uh, methane hydrates, as some have suggested, at the boundary, What's going on up here? Could this be somehow repeated or could they replenish the, 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 the reserve fast enough? But whatever happens, and that's a whole debate at the moment, I believe, um, I'm interested in this in terms of its effect on life. And so we have to keep this in mind, that Earth conditions are not stable. And so any pattern of recovery um, is going to be interrupted by these repeated insults of the environment. 
So, some of you may have been to Meishan. This is the um, type section in China of the Perma-Triassic. And the, 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 the Chinese people are very proud of their stratigraphic sections. Uh, and this one is a kind of uh, geo park. It's open to the public, and uh, the, the, there is a kind of theater which explains stratigraphy and all kinds of exciting things. And you can walk right up to the boundary. So you go up the steps here, and the PT boundary is somewhere in here. There it is, right there. I, don't, I can't really read Chinese. It says boundary right here, something like that. <coughs> And the public part is maybe not very promising, but uh, round the corner, you can see why this is a very good section. Um, the, there is a great deal of detail, and it's possible to sample uh, millimeter by millimeter through this section and get a great deal of detail. And then added to that, what I have found interesting is that the Meishan section covers maybe four or five million years across the boundary, but then it can be correlated and connected with um, Triassic sections all over South China, which provide a very complete record um, from uh, the Perma-Triassic boundary at the bottom, right up through to uh, late Triassic Carnian at the top. Um, and so Meishan is here in South China, Beijing is somewhere up here, um, I guess Shanghai is, is about here. And the Perma-Triassic sediments are uh, uh, the outcrop across the whole of South China. Um, and so these parts of sections are connected from different parts of that very large basin. One locality we worked on, just to give you some feeling for the, the, what the geology looks like, if you've not been there, is Luoping. And this is a um, middle Triassic locality. Uh, and the, the colleagues in Chengdu Geological Survey have carried out excavations. So basically, when they started, this was a regular mountain covered with grass and trees. They took away half the mountain. And so you can see the, a, a, a very continuous succession. And they were able to take away many tons of each layer and remove the fossils. So, uh, they, they made a huge fossil collection and sampled very carefully, um, bed by bed. And the kinds of fossils at this locality um, include marine reptiles. Uh, this is a, an ichthyosaur. Some remains of terrestrial reptiles. Here is a tooth. Um, some typical Middle Triassic fish like Saurichthys, um, which is of course known from the Muschel Kalk uh, of North Italy and, and Switzerland. Uh, as well as many other kinds of fishes, um, some other terrestrial remains like plants uh, and, and some terrestrial insects, um, and then all kinds of other fossils, limulids, uh, uh, echinoids, and often with um, uh, some exceptional preservation of soft tissues. Uh, we, we've worked with some very good artists who made very nice reconstructions. This is called Lobster Lunch of Lo Pi. And this is a variety of the fish and some of these extraordinary reptiles. This is not a turtle, but a placodont. Um, and here's the lobster that they're going to try to eat. And this is Xing Yi, which is somewhat younger. Um, and it has a great variety of marine reptiles and fishes. And then the most famous is Guan Ling which um, has marine reptiles, some quite large, um, but also has these extraordinary <coughs> pseudoplankton. This is um, like in uh, Holzmad in, in the Posidonian Schiefer of South Germany, where there are um, crinoids uh, uh, growing from floating logs. And in this case, in Guanling, these crinoids can be five or six meters long. They are huge. And then they create a kind of unusual environment for fishes and other creatures to live in. So in a very simple sense, it's possible to track the reconstruction of ecosystems in the early and middle Triassic. And so many uh, uh, parts of the ecosystem survived. And they include these uh, lower parts of the, the food chain. 
And then at the end of the early Triassic, you get the first um, marine reptiles, and they begin to build the ecosystem by adding another predatory layer. <coughs> and then in the Anisian, this is equivalent to low ping, you add large ichthyosaurs and some other marine reptiles, as well as placodonts, which are feeding, the, they are uh, durophages, they are feeding on the mollusks. So that's in very simple terms, but, uh, and I won't show you any more of that, but we are hoping to um, apply uh, uh, certain kinds of mathematical models to these ecosystems in more detail and to try to test the stability of the ecosystem because the evidence from terrestrial uh, uh, ecosystems is that they took maybe five or six million years to become stable. So they kind of recovered, but they were subject to, they could collapse a, a, a small perturbation. So this is the standard kind of uh, uh, diagram of recovery uh, with the isotope signals here. This is permatriassic boundary here and early Triassic, middle Triassic, and so importantly the earth, the, the, the ocean atmosphere system remained in some state of uh, uh, unusual conditions, perturbation, uh, for maybe six million years. And then finally the isotopes settled down, the carbon isotopes settled down at about this point. And low ping is somewhere in here. Um, and, and this we don't need to go through all of the different groups, um, <clears throat> but I think most people will know <clears throat> that the evidence for the uh, scale of the end Permian extinction, this was much more um, serious than the end Cretaceous or any of the others, and that is marked by the fact that on land uh, there is the so-called coal gap, um, and that corresponds to a time of no coal deposits. Coal was common in the uh, upper Permian in China, and then it stops. Um, and maybe for 10 million years, there is no coal anywhere. And that's taken to indicate the loss of forests. So trees, more or less, are absent for 10 million years after. That's quite serious. Um, and in the ocean, there is a similar 10 million year coral gap. Uh, which means the absence of reefs. Uh, and, and again, that's as serious. And then in deeper oceans, there is a church gap. So this, this was a time that caused extinction, but it caused some real um, structural changes in the nature of major um, ecosystems and environments. Um, people have been studying the, the fossils and the recovery, and they continue to do so. There must be 500 to 1,000 papers published every year now on different aspects of uh, the recovery. Many of the studies are in a traditional um, paleoecological frame, and the Chinese deposits and many of the others are uh, very good for this because fossils are rich, and the quality of dating is improving rapidly, so it's possible to uh, discriminate very, in great, a great deal of detail the sequence of faunas. But I want to concentrate on a, a set of different techniques for looking at recovery. Um, and these are techniques that are commonly used by evolutionary biologists. And they're becoming uh, more and more commonly used uh, with the fossil record. Um, a lot of these techniques require a phylogenetic tree. And so I work on vertebrates, and so that's helpful because we have a tradition of drawing these kind of detailed cladistic trees, phylogenetic trees. So here is a, a phylogeny of fish. Um, it's partly uh, uh, draw, it's drawn in a way to, to allow you to see the branching, but when we use it, we wouldn't be using these kinds of dates. You, all of this, this is the Permo-Triassic boundary here, and so all of this stuff, oops, all of this stuff um, in white would be pushed up above the boundary. And that corresponds to a very rapid uh, diversification of life in the earliest uh, Triassic. But the point here is that with um, some of the vertebrates, we have very rich data. 
Um, here we're looking at uh, many thousands of very beautiful fish specimens, each of which has uh, uh, hundreds of morphological characters. So there's a great deal of information there. And in the past, people would often uh, uh, disregard a lot of this information. Um, but of course, this is rich knowledge about, that can give you information about the rate of evolution, the rate of change. And similarly for the um, marine reptiles, Th this is an extraordinary um, explosion or radiation because there is no uh, trace of any of these uh, remarkable animals in the Permian and they just seem to appear in the early Triassic and then diversify fantastically. Um, and a great range of shapes and sizes as you can see, so ichthyosaurs and various other groups. Um, and where they came from, and, and what they were, what was, what they were replacing. It looks as if they are doing something new. That there, there were sharks in the Permian; these were replacing those, but they were also doing a lot of new stuff, I guess, ecologically. So um, we sometimes call the the phenomena that I'm going to talk about uh, macroevolution, big evolution, um, and that's the sort of area of evolution that paleontologists can study. Uh, and, and one criticism until recently was that the best we could do was to look at patterns. Whereas um, I think now we have good methods that allow us also to look at processes. Um, and that was something that I guess modern evolutionists would have said you can never do with the fossils. But in fact I believe we can in certain cases. So I'll show you that. Um, Part of the uh, 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 revolution that has happened in the last 10 years, let's say, um, has come about because of technical advances. We have certain numerical software we can use that did not exist. We can, we can run big calculations in ways that were not possible before. But also, I think almost all of these methods are based in the idea of a tree. So the phylogenetic tree is very important. Um, if you look at any general scientific journals, they're full of these kind of trees. This is a big part of modern uh, molecular biology, phylogenomics it's sometimes called. And there is a kind of desire to make a, a, a single tree of all of life or of large sectors of life. Um, sometimes these are called super trees, the word is used in different ways. Um, ten years ago we made a super tree of dinosaurs, this took a great deal of time. It was the biggest tree at the time, 500 species. We thought we did very well. Uh, two years ago, two or three years ago, a complete tree of birds was published with 10,000 species. And there are even bigger trees now. But this is, this is a fantastic resource for studying macroevolution. Because the tree can be dated using geological evidence, um, and then once you have a pattern of uh, branching and you have dates, you can then calculate rates of change. Um, and if you have character data about the different species, you can then look at the rate of change of different parts of the organism, body mass or other characters that you might be interested in. Behind a lot of the methods is uh, a, a, an assumption that we are testing. So I, I mentioned that a lot of the methods go beyond pattern, they go to process. And so that uh, a null model of evolution could be said to be a kind of random change, just change in different directions with no particular, uh, uh, no particular pattern. Brownian motion would be the kind of null expectation. And uh, since the 1990s, uh, a whole system of methods have been developed to, to, to run evolution through time, build theoretical branching patterns using a, a, a simple assumption of a birth-death model so you can have origin and extinction. Um, and then we compare real trees against these hypothetical models to try to see if there is any difference. And those differences can show us whether there are trends or other kinds of unusual changes. And so some of the, the standard kinds of um, uh, 
evolution models that people are looking for using these uh, uh, computational methods are shown here. The Brownian motion tree, this is a standard kind of uh, uh, evolutionary tree with time, geological time, uh, and the trait is just the character, it is morphology in some way. And so Brownian motion gives a tree with each branch as a species, and they are just branching with no particular direction, left, right, left, right, in no particular way. Uh, early burst is another kind of um, process model, which is saying all of the evolution is happening early. It's all happening here. And then nothing much happens in the upper part. Trend is where everything is going in one direction. And so you would then argue there is some selection, some pressure, evolutionary pressure, moving the species that way. Ornstein Uhlenbeck is, is where there is a kind of central tendency. The, the, the periphery, the, the extremes are removed and you keep coming back to a central pattern. The only other technical thing I have to introduce is, is disparity and then we will look at some results back to the, the Permo Triassic. I just have to define a few terms and give a few ideas about methods. Um, in English, we often use the word diversity in many different ways. And so we have to be clear, in these kinds of studies, we mean species richness, just the number of species. And we use a different word in a, in a technical way sometimes, which is disparity. And that is the morphological diversity. So that is the amount of variety of morphology. And as an example, uh, in this case here, in some classic work by David Rao in the 1960s, um, he argued that you could describe every possible, the shape, you could describe the shape of every possible gastropod with three measurements. And these measurements were to do with the nature of the coiling and the size of the aperture and things like that. And, and that is describing shape or disparity. And he took it further to plot all known gastropods in so-called morpho space to show the range of shapes. And he discovered certain species sit in different parts of morpho space. And indeed, there are parts of morpho space with no gastropods, so sort of forbidden areas or unexploited areas. <clears throat> And so if we have a concept of form and species richness, we can study those two separately. We can track them through time for any particular group. Um, and we can test certain important points about evolution. Because of course evolution goes on by multiplying species, but also by evolution of form. We're very interested in the appearance of organisms. Why is this ammonite different from that ammonite? How different is it? That kind of thing. And the null expectation would be that probably diversity and disparity should be somehow coupled. They should evolve together. But in fact, in many paleontological examples, we find that they are not, and that one evolves faster than the other. And in fact, the commonest pattern we find is disparity first. So that is when a new group originates, um, uh, the, 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 the species explore morphospace to the limits and then carry on evolving. Um, and, and that wasn't expected. So that, that's quite an interesting discovery. Let's have a look at some real cases, though. Um, and looking at vertebrates across the Permatriassic boundary, I want to show you two or three examples using some of these um, computational tools that we have available. Um, so first of all, dicynodonts. I'll show you a picture in a moment. This is a traditional uh, 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 diagram showing the uh, diversity through time. The Permatriassic boundary is here. So describing the evolution of dicynodonts, we can say that they uh, start at low diversity. They get very diverse here. They nearly die out at the boundary that two or three species survive, and then they radiate again in the Triassic. So this can be called an evolutionary bottle. They go through a low diversity time and expand. 
But here the question was, if that's what happens to species richness, what happens to morphology, fall, disparity? <clears throat> so here is a typical dicynodont. This is a very famous one, Lystrosaurus, um, one of the famous um, terrestrial survivors and well known from uh, many different parts of the world and in fact this one known from thousands of specimens. The data for this study is very rich. Um, people have been collecting these uh, rather large uh, or rather he bulky, rather, rather heavy uh, animals so they're well fossilized, the fossils are easy to identify and there are each of these is a species, here's the Permatriassic boundary so there are a hundred or more species and, and the time ranges are quite uh, known in quite a bit of detail from different parts of the world. We also can create a phylogeny. So here is some work I did with a Russian colleague and we can see the uh, great diversity of late, uh, late Permian dicynodonts here and then two or three species survive and then here is the second flower second radiation in the Triassic. So the pattern of evolution is, is fairly clear. In terms of disparity, um, we found something slightly unexpected, or maybe it is expected. They have gone through a bottleneck. So in the Permian, in yellow and green, this is the distribution in morphospace of the group. So they cover quite a large area of morphospace. Um, in comparison, the Triassic forms shown in blue occupy about half that morphospace. It's different, so this shows they are morphologically different. They are, they are separated into a different place. And in fact, I should point to this one here. Um, if, if we remove this one, then the morphospace occupied is about one-tenth. And in fact, this one here, if we just go back, is this one here. So in fairness, that one does not contribute to the middle Triassic uh, massive diversity of the group. And so we can say that although diversity recovered after the bottleneck, um, disparity did not. And so they have lost a great deal of their evolutionary potential. Here's a second group, the cynodonts. These are, uh, the dicynodonts were plant eaters. These are uh, meat eaters, carnivores, uh, and they include the ancestors of mammals. So for this study, um, we had to make our own uh, phylogeny because there was not one available. And this, this is it, showing the genera and their distributions in time. So this is the basic information that is essential, and this has to be um, determined very carefully, of course. So this uses many traditional methods to, to, to get that information. And then we wanted to track um, changing forms, so track diversity and disparity through time. And we found that the rate of disparity acquisition was highest in the early Triassic. So the group originated here. They didn't undergo any great extinction. They began to diversify, and in fact, that rate slowed down. So if we compare um, disparity and diversity, you can plot them both as semi-independent variables and then compare through time. And so diversity rises in the middle uh, uh, Triassic and then goes up and down. Disparity rises rapidly and then levels off. So we, this is one example where we would argue it is early burst um, disparity first. The third example is to do with dinosaurs. And when we think of dinosaurs and mass extinction, we think of the end of the dinosaurs, 66 million years ago at the end of the Cretaceous. However, there is a great deal of evidence now, the whole view has changed in the last 10 years, that the Permo-Triassic mass extinction was important in triggering um, the rise of the dinosaurs. Um, <clears throat> and this, this change of opinion has happened because of new fossils. So when I began to study this question, the oldest 
dinosaurs were from the late Carnian. And this was about halfway through the Triassic. Here's the uh, Permatriassic boundary. Here's the Triassic-Jurassic boundary. And the oldest fossils from places like Ischugalasto in Argentina were halfway through the Triassic. But since then, um, some tracks have been reported, which may be dinosaur, but that wouldn't really be enough, I don't think, to, to, to make the change. But in addition, um, uh, various uh, uh, incomplete but reasonably convincing fossils have been found in the Anisian. So this brings the origin of dinosaurs back by 15 or 20 million years. Just so you have a reminder of why young people get excited about dinosaurs, this is a reconstruction of some of the famous early uh, tri uh, dinosaurs from the late Triassic, um, Coelophysis from North America. And we have done a number of uh, uh, numerical studies of dinosaur origins to try to understand um, some of the dynamics of how that was happening. And there had been uh, uh, many debates or discussions about how dinosaurs emerged. Um, they became so dominant on land, they became so large, uh, that people assumed this was a, an interesting case of um, evolutionary replacement. And in some cases, the model for uh, origin of dinosaurs involved quite active competition and a kind of driving evolution of the group. So in this study done with my master's student at the time, Steve Brusata, we looked at um, disparity of early dinosaurs in relation to the other groups that they were replacing. And in summary, we could not find evidence that dinosaurs were radiating aggressively they were radiating quite slowly. The, the expansion was quite slow. And there was very little evidence that they were affecting other groups. And so to explain the diagrams here, this is late Triassic at the top. This is early Jurassic at the bottom. I should switch them around. And in the late Triassic, here are the, this is the morphospace occupied by dinosaurs. Here are the other um, archosaur groups that they were competing with um, and these include the ancestors of crocodiles, these include the ancestors of birds. And at that time at least uh, the, uh, this other group, the Crurotarsi, were dominant in terms of morphospace. And then at the end of the Triassic there was an extinction event and a great number of these Crurotarsans went extinct and their morphospace reduced greatly. That is simply the ancestors of crocodiles. Um, the dinosaurs didn't really do very much, so they haven't massively taken advantage yet of that change. And then when the sum of disparity was tracked through time, um, the argument we made was if dinosaurs were actively competing with Crurotarsans, you should see some impact of the expansion of morphospace of dinosaurs on Crurotarsi. And we argued there is some slight impact. The dinosaurs are rising, the Crurotarsans continue to rise, there is a slight slower, maybe. And then across the TJ boundary, the extinction happens and they go right down here. Um, and dinosaurs actually go across with very little change. So, at the very least, we could say there may be some interaction, but not very much, and maybe none at all between the two. An independent study using slightly different approaches, using a, 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 a phylogenetic approach and testing for um, trend models of evolution, was done by Sukias and colleagues in 2012. And this diagram is from their work. And they were testing all the way through, could they find any evidence of interaction between these two groups? They were admittedly simply looking at body size change. Um, so here are the dinosaurs and relatives. They get bigger and bigger. This is Permo-Triassic. I should put the, the scale on 
the PT boundary is somewhere about here. And these are the therapsids, and they get smaller and smaller, and here are the first mammals. But in neither case could they find evidence of active trend. They were, they call them passive trend. They're just changing size and doing it at such a slow rate that you can't um, demonstrate a model of active trend, active uh, competition. Nearly done. I just wanted to introduce uh, very briefly a new method that we're hoping to apply uh, to, to, to these questions of recovery. Um, we published uh, a, a few months ago in PNAS a, uh, a study on uh, uh, the, 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 the end of the dinosaurs and the, the method here uh, was to use so-called Bayesian species dynamic model. The input data are the same as what I've been describing. So you need, a, a, you need phylogenetic data, you need geological time data, you need character data. Here we were simply using body size. And we don't use mass, we just use a length, like a bone length. Um, but the Bayesian method allows multiple calculations, millions of calculations, in which the tree shape and the dates and all kinds of uncertainties are multiply tested and, and, and against each other. Uh, and we're looking here at the comparison of uh, origination and extinction of each species. So this is looking at the volatility of evolution in general. And so around the trend, or each trend, there is a great deal of variation. So each line is a different calculation. But the mean of all those calculations shows a significant fact that we had not expected. Here is the, the, the summary of all dinosaurs from late Triassic into uh, late Cretaceous. Here is the KT boundary. And the overall uh, uh, pattern of um, species, species turnover is that the rate of evolution is slowing down. So this, this simple plot is based on an enormous number of calculations um, that take account of all kinds of uncertainty in the data. And there's plenty of uncertainty. Um, and then we took apart the data to look at the three different groups of dinosaurs, um, the large sauropods, the carnivorous theropods, um, and the ornithischians. So we wanted to know, were they all showing this pattern? And indeed they were. So this was not driven by one group of dinosaurs or some other group. They're all showing uh, uh, a slowdown. And in fact, in the end, we recognized two groups, um, the hadrosaurs and the ceratopsians, which were going against the overall trend. So we took those out, and what was a leveling off became a decline. So the overall pattern is that these two groups were expanding actively, and all the others were, were in decline. And the de decline starts something like 50 million years before the end of the Cretaceous. This was a kind of analysis that at one time people would have thought was impossible, but now we have such rich amounts of data that we can now apply these um, rather advanced computational methods. And they have many advantages that they can accommodate uncertainty um, so that, that you take you, you, you're not ignoring it in any way, um, but you're able to look through it and try to get to the fundamental pattern of what is happening. And uh, I'm sure we're, we're beginning designing a project here to, to look at, to use these methods to look at um, comparing different groups as they go through the Permo-Triassic, because you can not only look at single groups and their behavior and, and get a real picture of uh, uh, the, the, the vigor of evolution, what's going on. These methods have also been used in published cases to compare groups, so you can actually, for the first time, test whether groups are competing with each other. So that's going to be very interesting to try and apply that. I'll just go past that. So I'll summarize then briefly. Thank you for your attention. I apologize. I hope you, the sound has been OK. I apologize. I've been speaking English. I hope the images have made it reasonably clear. Um, I think everybody here knows about the vast interest in, uh, in the Permo-Triassic mass extinction. 
I think everybody knows uh, a lot of the current work is coming out of China. Um, there are many international groups working there, many very active Chinese colleagues. So there is an enormous uh, uh, burst of activity. Uh, so I've talked a little bit about the geological background, but maybe some of you are less familiar with some of these uh, computational evolutionary approaches. Um, but I think they have enormous potential. And a good thing about it is that they are founded on very, very thorough and careful um, evaluation of the fossil record, meaning that we need and we need to establish and collect, and, and this is the sort of thing I do and the sort of thing Pass Raya does and others, is to pay a great deal of attention to getting very, very accurate stratigraphic data, very, very accurate data about the quality of specimens, proper understanding of taxonomy, uh, so we know what the species are. And then once all of those are established, then you can get, I think, quite amazing kinds of results out of those data. Um, and I think, finally, uh, this, this revolution in, in the way we can use the data is, is speaking out to a wider community. So here we are able to take um, classic kinds of paleontological data, which at one time would only be of interest strictly to the paleontologists themselves, out to a wider field of uh, evolutionary biologists who find a lot of these results understandable because we're speaking the same language and using the same software, um, but also quite fascinating because they may not have access to this kind of information from, from the genome. They, you have to use the fossils to get this kind of uh, information about how evolution works. So thank you very much for your attention. Professor Benton for your lecture. We have time for uh, questions, curiosities, uh, doubts uh, from the floor. So everybody is invited to, to ask Professor Benton. Yes, please. Elisabetta. Thank Yes, I'll, I'll repeat the question. Um, so the question is, because the extinction event may have been the most extreme ever, is the recovery perhaps the most extreme? I think that's a difficult question to answer because, of course, we have to think about the Cambrian as well. And that was a time of extremely, we believe, extremely uh, rapid radiation of many um, groups of animals not necessarily following a mass extinction, but um, maybe at the same rate. I suppose we could argue in this particular case, um, there is a relevance to um, questions that people maybe ask about uh, the current biodiversity crisis. Here at least we can say, well, life was driven nearly to complete annihilation, complete extinction, um, and we can track how the recovery happened. Um, but we wouldn't want to give people any false hopes because, of course, to a geologist, 10 million years is not a long time, but to voters and human beings, 10 million years is far too long. Yes. So the question is about um, 
how we handle um, issues of disparity or morphological variation um, and the recognition of species. There are many paleontologists in this room. I could ask you all to answer that question and I think we would all have some difficulty in answering. Um, mainly with paleontological species, they are morpho species, so we only have morphology to define the species. But I suppose in addition to that, we're trying to track them through time and you try to look for evidence of branching. So you're trying to constrain in some way and maybe look at variation within that one species. For the disparity plots, we're, we're looking often at larger kinds of characters. So um, we, may be, we may be looking at overall shape or we may be looking at lists of cladistic characters. So um, there will be some fuzziness. Um, but I suppose if you do disparity based on specimens rather than species, then in a way you avoid any difficulty because you can, you can measure a thousand specimens and simply plot them and then make a hypothesis, oh, this looks like one species, another species. And you are then also at the same time documenting the variation within the species and the distance between any pair of possible species. But in the end, of course, when we're dealing with fossils, we, can, we can't always be 100% certain that we're getting species definitions right. Any other Thank you again, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Allora, il primo evento di questo congresso si è appena concluso. Passiamo a qualche, diciamo, una fase di convivialità. Quindi nel porticato qui del, del chiostro. Uh, ci sarà il convenzionale e spero gradito icebreaker party che uh, avrà inizio di qui a qualche minuto. Vi ringrazio e vi do appuntamento uh, domattina dalle 9 a giurisprudenza per la cerimonia inaugurale. Grazie ancora.